Welcome everyone to today's uh, final session for the Critical Disability Studies Group. And we have three wonderful presenters and it's really exciting to have them here with us today. Uh, prior to it beginning, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm actually presenting on from the unceded lands of the Gadigal people um, and pay my respect to elders past and present and emerging and recognise in particular the critical role of settler colonialism in the production of impairment and disability in Australia and what that's mean for uh, the racialisation of Australian settler colonial relations and its enduring and ongoing impact of Indigenous inequality across all spheres in the Australian settler state. We have three presenters today. Um, we have um, Tom, then we have Ray, and then we have Sonia, and I'll give a little introduction um, to each of them prior to their papers. So first of all, I would like to start um, with Tom Neville, who is a PhD candidate in the School of Social Sciences of the University of Western Australia. His research focuses on the intersections between learning disability, social class and inclusion in the context of the development of anti-discriminatory and inclusive educational policies. He has a particular interest in the lived experience of students diagnosed with dyslexia and their parents. Today, Tom's paper is called a diagnosis, it's a diagnosis for the rich, reproductions at the intersections of disability and class. And before we begin, I'd just like to ask you to put your um, uh, voices on mute and um, to hold any questions to after um, Tom has finished his paper. Thank you. Over to you, Tom, and welcome. It's great Thanks, to have these students here. Cheers. So it's um, 6 a.m. in Western Australia, or just afterwards. So if I sound a little tired, that's why. Um, so thanks for having me today. Um, I'm presenting on unceded land of Wujak Noongar people. So I'd like to acknowledge that first. Um, so today I'll be presenting a paper that I wrote with Glenn Savage and Martin Fawzi, and it focuses on the strategies that parents of dyslexic children take to advocating for them in secondary school settings. I'll be looking at how these strategies link to the micro processes and practices in which inequalities related to disability and social class are reproduced in education systems. So for the last, you know, really since the discipline's inception, um, a large amount of sociological research has examined how institution, educational institutions operate as mechanisms for the reproduction of social inequalities. Bourdieu's theory of cultural reproduction holds that inequality is continually reproduced because the whole education system is overlain with the dominant group's ideology, practices, and beliefs. Whilst there remains an interest in the structural conditions of reproduction, in recent decades, there's been a shift towards focusing on understanding the context-specific strategies that parents take to generate advantages for their children and positive outcomes. This work's been pioneered through the research of Stephen Ball and Diane Ray, and it's focused on how micro processes and relations between families and then institutions such as schools produce relative advantage for some and disadvantage for others. Now, most of the research on social practice and social reproduction in the sociological research has focused on class. And little research has specifically examined the reproduction of inequalities that combine a focus on class and disability. Now, relative inattention to the reproduction of disability-based inequalities in education systems and how this intersects with class is really emblematic of the marginal status of disability and sociological research. And we can see this nicely put by Schiffer and Frederick on the slides. Now, it's really significant to have greater focus on the intersection between disability and class because it will help advance sociological models of reproduction by drawing attention and uncovering the different and intersecting dimensions of inequality and privilege that are simultaneously reproduced in schools. So why focus on parental advocacy? Well, a large body of research has shown 
that parents of students with disabilities play a key role in ensuring that their needs are recognised, that they're provided with support, as well as important resources and well as access to mainstream schools. Much of the research on advocacy in the last 10 years hasn't focused on class. However, through the work of the on dean and trainer in the US context mainly, we're beginning to understand the ways in which it overlaps with social class. And their research has shown that the financial and cultural advantages afforded to the middle classes significantly bolster their advocacy capacities and efforts, thereby increasing the gap in access to support and resources between children from middle class and low income backgrounds. So the results from this research is still preliminary, but it does suggest that advocacy is one of the primary ways in which inequalities linked to social class and disability are reproducing education systems, and therefore it warrants far greater attention in the sociological research. So reproduction and advocacy don't happen in a vacuum, they're deeply influenced by other social and political forces. And here I'm particularly interested in how the processes of responsabilization, which have been widely viewed as a key feature of neoliberal forms of government, influence the micro processes through which inequalities are reproduced in education systems. We can see O'Malley's definition of responsabilization on the slides. So it's important to focus on responsabilization because a large body of research has shown that the processes of responsabilization reframe and reconfigure the conditions of possibility for schooling. So that when compared to prior generations, a child's academic future and their well-being depends more, although not entirely, on the actions and practices of their parents. So in view of this, I was interested in exploring how responsabilization pervades the processes of micro the micro process of reproduction, therefore shaping the strategies that parents take. So with some of the background outlined, I'm gonna be focusing on two key questions. First, what strategies do parents take to advocating for their children? And second, how are these strategies shaped by their social class? To understand how their strategies are shaped by social class, I'll be drawing on Bourdieu's theory of practice. These concepts have all been discussed in depth for a long time, so I'll go through them briefly now. But this habitus, which refers to attitudes, dispositions that stem from one's educational and family backgrounds, and it deeply influences people's outlooks towards education. So that's a shortened version. And then there's capital. So there's multiple forms of capital. Here I'll be focusing on economic capital, referring to financial resources, and then cultural capital that takes many forms, including embodied and professional. In this presentation, I'll be drawing on LaRue and Weniger's application of cultural capital, which they define as knowledge of and familiarity with familiar institutional contexts, as well as knowledge and processes and expected social skills. The Zen field, and there's multiple overlapping fields that constitute social reality. Here, I'll be focusing on the field of parental advocacy and then education. Now, all these concepts interact so in this presentation, I'll be looking at the ways in which the demands of the field of advocacy in turn shape the sorts of capital that are imbued with importance um, for the parents and then the sorts of outlooks and attitudes towards education that become significant in this context. So the data that I'll be presenting today draws from my PhD research in which I interviewed 19 mothers and their secondary children with dyslexia over the course of the 2020 school year. I conducted multiple interviews with the participants, usually once a school term, and through interviewing the participants on multiple occasions, I was able to afford a concurrent account of their school in capturing key changes, continuities, conflicts, and support. In the context of this paper, through interviewing the participants on multiple occasions, I was able to see how their approaches to advocacy changed, as well as the impact of this advocacy and their point of view on that. Um, this presentation just focuses on the data from parents. Now, I decided to focus on dyslexia because whilst it's one of the most widely known learning disabilities and most diagnosed learning disability, only six qualitative published studies have been completed that focus on these experience of these students' experiences in schooling in Australia. Therefore, it warrants far greater attention in the research. Um, also, Learning disabilities have only recently become a key topic in disability studies, and it's more so been 
autism has generated a lot of research and educational research recently. So I'm interested in contributing to the field in that way too. Um, I initially aimed to recruit an equal proportion of parents who have a higher family education tradition. So meaning they or one of their family members had a degree in higher education because this is going to signify a privilege and social class. However, um, most of the participants who expressed interest in the study came from middle class and upper middle class backgrounds. Therefore, this paper presents more of analysis of how privilege operates in education systems and some of the ways in which this generates inequality. So now I'll be discussing the key findings that I reach in the research. So first, I'll be discussing the factors that made parents confident to advocate for their children. So the participants attributed the confidence that they felt to advocate to their, for their child to a combination of factors that are clearly linked to their social class. So first, parents were able to advocate for and organize a formal diagnosis report, which was often a complex, time-consuming, and above all else, costly endeavor. So in Western Australia, it costs $1,000 to pay for a diagnosis. In addition, parents have to pay for six months of intervention before they get this diagnosis report in the first place. Now, as most of the participants in the study came from privileged backgrounds, this does not form a barrier to them and they are able to access a diagnosis. However, we can consider that the price of the diagnosis is likely to form barriers from families to low income backgrounds from accessing it and therefore the associated benefits and advantages. Now, as we can see here in the slide, when Carol talks about the impact of having a diagnosis, it really gives parents a set of legitimacy that they're not making up that their children are experiencing difficulties in schools. And in effect, it can be used as a bargaining chip to ensure that their child's needs are firstly recognized and then that they're provided with resources. Therefore, it constitutes a important form of capital in itself, as well as imbuing parents with confidence to advocate for their children. Second, parents described a significant amount of importance to their family backgrounds, and in particular, their professional backgrounds and their educational backgrounds. And we can see this nicely illustrated by Megan as she discusses how both her and her husband were tertiary educated. They felt comfortable in education settings. They weren't intimidated by teachers and they could assertively advocate for their children in schools. Another important thing here is that many of the participants were teachers in the study, which is interesting and they had a good understanding then of the education system, how it worked, how to interact with teachers and so on. So in thinking about these two factors, we can see that being able and prepared to advocate for one's child is not an innate quality. Instead, it can hinge on parents having the requisite financial resources to access the diagnosis and then perhaps more critically, um, the capital linked to one's middle-class backgrounds, which imbues them with a sense of confidence to act assertively in schools. And this is really significant because much of the time the parents had to advocate really assertively in school context to ensure that their children's needs were supported and that they were provided with resources. So the second key finding relates to how parents mobilize knowledge of educational processes, rules, and policies as a form of cultural capital to bolster the advocacy efforts. So we can see here represented on the chart, it's like a process going on when parents mobilize this knowledge of noticing and gapping support and then searching for knowledge, which could be a form of policy or they could contact a friend in their network or look online, and then they try to mobilize it. Now critical to a microprocessor's perspective from reproduction, whether or not they mobilized this knowledge successfully was uncertain and it was shaped by context. And this is well outlined when we compare Cheryl's experiences. So in term one, Cheryl noticed that her daughter was no longer being provided with a radar in tests, um, which significantly diminished her ability to access the tests. Uh, Cheryl went to the learning support coordinator and she asked why she was no longer being provided with a radar and the learning support coordinator argued that she wasn't eligible for a radar under the school curriculum and standards authority guidelines. Cheryl was uncertain and didn't believe this. So she contacted the authority and she knew she could do this because she had 
knowledge of the education system as she's a teacher. She actually pretended that she was talking about one of her students when she called them on the phone. And she asked if it was the learning support coordinator who made this decision. And the authority told her that it was actually the principal who could make this decision. So armed with this knowledge, she went to the school, she contacted the vice principal and then the principal, and he agreed that her daughter would be able to use a reader. And this significantly bolstered her ability to access and achieve well on the test. Therefore, we can see in this case, her advocacy efforts were enhanced. Now, let's go to term three. In term three, Cheryl noticed that some of her daughter's teachers did not have a great understanding of dyslexia. So she emailed the learning support coordinator, included a section of the students' educational risk policy that outlined that teachers must have training on learning disabilities. Now, in contrast to a successful mobilization of capital in term one, in this case, the learning support coordinator dismissed this knowledge and said that teachers choose their professional learning and moreover, that the school didn't have the funds to provide additional training. So in thinking about the different outcomes, of this um, advocacy, we can see that the value ascribed to capital is always circumstantial and is determined by how it is interpreted by people in positions of power, such as the principal and the learning support coordinator. Now this highlights that for parents, even those with deep reservoirs of cultural capital are not able to go always able to ensure that their child's needs are going to be looked after when they are faced with gaps in the provision of support. Another thing that's important to think about here is that Cheryl's and other parents' experiences illustrate how in some circumstances the enactment of policy is determined by the actions of parents who in the absence of support and government action find themselves responsible for ensuring that things like adjustments are provided. So the last um, key finding from the research was how parents adopted harnessing private support as a strategy to fill in gaps in provision in the school context. So symptomatic of the rapid global increase in the use of private support, such as tutoring, um, many of the parents, and we can see this here with all the pictures around the slide, access significant amounts of private support for their children, including assistive technology, intervention programs, tutoring and training for themselves about how they can support their children. Now, I argue that the need for parents to access this support represents a distinct form of responsabilization where parents act in the absence of government action rather than being actively responsibilized to take on this responsibility which is usually how responsabilization is talked about in the research. Um, now, the ability of parents to access this support clearly depended on their financial capital. And we can see here how Trish discusses that her son wasn't being provided with supporting school and thus she was gonna have to pay for tutoring. She was in the position where she could do this because she had the financial resources to pay for the tutoring. So parents were in that position where they could pay for the support when ideally this support would have been provided in the school context. So whilst parents were often okay with having to provide this support to their children, some of them also expressed frustration, especially those who spent a considerable amount of money to pay for a house in an expensive area because they expected that the school that their child would go to would be supportive of their children's needs. And we can see this from Susie. So she. Her daughter goes to one of the most um, well-known and privileged uh, public schools in Western Australia. And she brought a house, you know, next to the river. And she thought that she wouldn't have to fork out any more private support after sending her daughter to this school. But this ended up not being the case. And she actually struggled quite a bit financially with having to pay for thousands of dollars of private support. So if we think that someone like Susie is going to have difficulties paying for this private support, then what impact is this going to have on someone from a low income background who's not going to be able to maybe buy a diagnosis, let alone all these forms of tutoring? So we can see how in this setting responsabilization where more and more parents is like an expectation that they're going to provide this support, how this expectation then results in it not being provided in the education system. And then these gaps continue. And this has a particularly coercive effect 
on those from low income backgrounds who aren't going to be able to pay for this support. So in thinking about these findings, we can see that the first main point is that the strategies parents took to advocacy um, were underpinned by a distinctly middle-class disposition towards schooling, marked by high levels of parental involvement and possession of considerable economic capital along with specialized forms of cultural capital. Considering the ways in which these forms of advocacy hinge on parents having forms of capital that are more readily available to middle classes, we suggest that the reliance on parental advocacy to ensure children's needs are supported will ultimately magnify class-based inequalities that are brought in system scale. Second, many of the children would not have been support, provided with support and the needs would not have been recognized if it wasn't for parents acting on their behalf and advocating. And even when some parents did this, the gaps in support persisted, especially those structural issues such as a lack of training on dyslexia and also a lack of funding for dyslexic students under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Therefore, we can see here how parents needing to fill in these gaps in support actually results in these gaps persisting and these structural issues occur, keep, keeping on occurring because parents are actually filling them in and when they don't address these gaps, they're still there. So we can see how the reliance on parental advocacy actually contributes to reproducing an education system that is not inherently inclusive of students with disability and actually remain, um, relies on parental advocacy to be inclusive. So in conclusion, this should make us think about who should really be inclusive, uh, who, so, sorry, who should be responsible for inclusion in the contemporary period. Because at the moment, while there's grand declarations made in policies and by schools, it seems that parents really have the burden of holding much of this responsibility. And this seems to have a particularly coercive effect on those from the least privileged backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Martin. That was uh, Tom. Sorry, I was thinking of Martin Forrest. Sorry about that. That was a fantastic paper.